Okay, good morning. It seems like it's been forever, right? We still have three lectures, including today's. And we're almost done. I know you're, you feel burned out. Uh, no, you're not burned out. Okay, Jevin is not burned out. <laughs> Um, but we're almost there. Um, these remaining lectures are essentially overviews of some other topics in CFD. Uh, today's focus is going to be on modeling and simulation of, of turbulent flows. So if you remember the first few lectures, <coughs> I said that CFD touches on many topics and you cannot do one without the other. Although CFD is not about modeling, modeling is not possible without CFD, and CFD is not possible without models. And so they go in hand in hand. And typically, when you are developing a model, such as a turbulence model, you keep in mind, um, you're keeping in mind where you're applying it and on what platforms you're applying it. So that you, you, you in the model development process, you, you keep that in mind. So for example, a, you may be developing a model that requires sign the solution of many, many, many linear systems, large global linear systems. You know, that's not gonna be uh, conducive for uh, large scale CFD calculations because linear systems are expensive, right? So, you know, that's how you keep, thing you keep those things in mind. Um, this lecture is not, the purpose uh, is not to teach you about turbulence. You learned that um, in another course. I'm not a turbulence expert, but I know enough about the models and what they need, what we need to do to implement them in our code, and that's what I hope to share with you uh, today. There will not be many case studies um, on, on the application and performance of these models, so I apologize about that, but the guts of the You'll, you'll understand the guts of the implementation and the basics of what we call the turbulence closure problem. Who's heard of the turbulence closure problem? Okay, um, do you have an idea of, of what it is? Um, okay, so that's from your LES. Yeah, that's a similar procedure. So that also applies to scalar closure. So in a turbulent flow, you're going to apply the same procedure that Elizabeth was talking about, um, and you're going to end up with terms that are unknowns and that you need to model. Um, but we'll learn about that. OK, so let me start by quoting an airline passenger who said to me once, turbulence makes me sick. Um, that may be me, or maybe another passenger, but it's an airline passenger. OK, so why do we want to study turbulence? Um, of course, the cliche answer is that most turbulent flow, most, most flows encountered in engineering um, are actually turbulent flows. So it's, it's unheard of to say um, we're just dealing with laminar flows. Um, many cases are laminar. Uh, you can assume many systems to be laminar, but for the most part, the most interesting applications are um, um, turbulent flows. And by turbulent flows, we're not saying just high speed. Okay, so be careful. Um, turbulence does not mean you're at high speed. Turbulence means you're at high Reynolds number. Um, and so hopefully that rings some bells in your understanding of fluids. Now, <clears throat> when I tell you turbulence, how do, what do you understand? When I, what do you think when I say turbulence? What is, what's happening in turbulence? What distinguishes structure? Little eddies moving around. A lot of st so what does what does stochastic mean? It looks random. You have a great answer. It looks random. The, there's there's um, I'm not gonna get, get into the philosophy of this, um, but I had a professor who said, is randomness a, is something true or is it our inability to describe reality so precisely that we per we call we perceive as randomness? Um, so yes, turbulence is characterized by what appears to us what looks to us as random events, things that are just happening randomly. You're looking at this nice, smooth um, pipe flow. You take your, your, um, um, your uh, water hose in the garden, and you start increasing your flow rate. And you see, at, at, if, you increase, if you start increasing it very, very slowly, you see at some point you're going to see like these, these bursts where, where, where the water is coming out nice and smoothly cylindrical. And then it does kind of these bursts. And then it's just all over the place. You're, um, it becomes very turbulent. So, so it's characterized by these intermittent um, random events. But what's, what's 
uh, uh, more important is it, uh, 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 in depth of turbulence is what Elizabeth referred to these structures, um, these fine scales and what you called eddies. So uh, turbulence is also really characterized by a very large number of time and length scales. So you see these structures. There are structures that are of the size of your domain. So let's say you have an airflow in this room that's turbulent. There's motion that is of the size of the room because all of us feel it, but there's also motion that is of the size of these little holes here in the projector and everything in between. So you have a very large number of eddies, each of which has a different length scale or diameter, and um, that characterizes turbulence, is this very wide range of scales that is nearly infinite. Okay, and also these eddies, they spin and rotate and break at different time scales and at different rates. So you have the large rotating eddy maybe moving at the rate of, um, you know, one meter per second, right? But then you have the small eddies maybe moving at a rate of, uh, you know, two meters per second or three meters per second, spinning at three meters per second. Okay, um, this is a simulation of... Um, um, this, these, the, the scales that I just referred to. And what I want you to, I'm going to play it a few times. I want, what I want you to pay attention to is look at the big trends of how the small vortices are all spinning at a very large, at, with, with the large scale. So that's actually the large scale. And then focus at the small eddies and see how they're moving and everything in between. This is a Rayleigh-Taylor instability simulation. So you see that this motion is a large-scale motion, but whatever is happening at the boundary is small-scale motion. And at each boundary, there's even more and more scales. And they're all spinning at different rates and at different speeds. So length and time scales, OK? Length and time scales, right? So you see these little eddies, they start breaking up really fast. But the larger ones, they're moving a little bit slower, right? So if you can track. Like that. This is another one. Um, all these simulations from the turbulence team, if you can find them on YouTube, they have some pretty cool um, simulations. Okay. Um, now, one other feature that characterizes turbulence is that the fact that the, you have all of these eddies and length and time scales, that promotes mixing significantly. So the reason you stir a cup when you add um, uh, sugar or salt <laughs> or tea, the reason you stir it is you're enforcing this mixing. You're creating, artificially creating, you're adding energy, you're, adding, you're creating these eddies to mix and promote the mixing of uh, uh, the solute that you want to add to your, to your water. So turbulence greatly enhances mixing. Um, some people look at, um, don't use the word randomness in turbulence. Um, I don't care, use it, you know, use it as long as you call it apparent randomness, um, that's fine. Um, it promotes mixing, um, it, it enhances vorticity, and has a lot of length and time scales. Okay, so let's start digging deeper historically into what um, Osborne Reynolds discovered. And so he had this uh, pipe flow, so there's water coming in from the left. And it's leaving out of here. And he's got a dye ink over here injected at the center line. And he's, he is changing, he started changing the flow rate. So he's changing the velocity. Okay? And he noticed that um, for a given diameter, there was only one parameter that controls what you're going to see now. So you see now there's initially nice flow. Is actually moving, and then you reach a point where you start seeing these wiggles, and they kind of dissipate, but then they grow, and then they dissipate, they start bursting. So this is transition, this is called transition, right here. And now you move into turbulence. Who knows what's going on, okay? So that's the original experiment um, by uh, Osborne, it's not, that's not the one, it's the replication of it. Okay. So if you were to measure the velocity at the center line at some point, in the laminar regime, you are just measuring a nice constant value over time. You repeat the experiment, same thing. But as you increase the Reynolds number, this is what you're going to measure for the velocity. It's just going to be all over the place. Now you think that the mean is going to be almost similar to what you would expect from a pipe flow, but um, instantaneously, the velocity is all over the place. Okay? So what's going on? 
It seems that the flow, according to Reynolds, the flow is sensitive to a single parameter known as the Reynolds number. That's why the Reynolds number is so important in turbulence, um, ratio of inertial to viscous effects. And um, it's not the velocity, so it's not the speed that matters only. It's not the viscosity alone and not the pipe diameter. It's their combination along with the density, rho VD over mu. It's that number that um, tells you if you are in the turbulent regime or not. Okay? Now, this behavior is similar to what is called chaos in dynamical systems. So, um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to use some slides that I used for uh, years ago when I was uh, uh, doing my final project as an undergraduate student. And I had some slides on um, turbulence and characterizing turbulence. I, I took the following example from a classic book on turbulent flows by Stephen Pope. And um, it essentially takes an example, a classic example of a dynamical system um, attributed to the guy who discovered uh, chaos, um, uh, referred to as the Lorentz uh, system of equations. So a classic example of a dynamical system is the Lorentz system, which describes fluid motion in the atmosphere. Okay, and it's described by these three ODEs. dx dt is some coefficient times y minus x, y dot or dy dt is rho x minus y minus xz, and z dot is minus beta z plus xy. He had a model for the atmosphere, um, x, y, and z, uh, I don't know, I, I don't remember what they denote, but think of them as, uh, you know, velocity and height or something. Um, anyway, these are the three ODEs that he was dealing with, okay? And I'll tell you the story in a second of what happened. Now, L Lorenz observed, he would run the simulations and then, you know, he wanted to go and sleep at home, so he would, um, um, he would turn off the computers, save the data, turn off the computer and go home, and then come back the next day and then restart um, from the data. Now when he saved the data, rather than taking a, um, let's say, 32-bit um, um, precision number, saving the 32-bit precision number, he would save the 16-bit to save on storage, thinking that, you know, it's not going to matter. It's only like the difference, I'm, I'm only kind of reducing the accuracy a little bit in, the, in, the, in, in saving the data. And then I'm going to restart the next day. And then he noticed that, as he repeated experiments, he noticed that um, if he ran the simulation for a full day versus running simulation for half a day and then restarting the next day, he got completely different results. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Is my code, is there something with my code? So after digging and digging, he noticed that his system um, was very sensitive to these three parameters or any combination of these three parameters and the initial conditions. So what we're going to do now, we're going to replicate what he observed. Okay? So we will fix two parameters, sigma and beta, and we will vary rho. Hint, hint, rho is actually the Reynolds number. Okay? So we're going to vary the Reynolds number as we fix the other two guys. And we're going to test according, we're going to mimic his experiment. So we're going to test according to these two different initial conditions, but they are so close, right? First initial condition, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Second initial condition is 0.1 plus 10 to the minus 6 plus point and 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So you'd think, ah, you know, if why? I, I don't see any reason for why this system would behave very differently if we had these two initial conditions. Okay? So some of these plots are low quality because I took them from uh, the days I used to use MathCAD. And that was, that was in 2001, 2000, about 2000. So I used to use MathCAD. So this is, these are the, simu the results for rho equal 5. And what I'm showing here is I'm looking only at x of t for uh, about 60 seconds, OK, with the initial condition. And then you integrate it over time. So this is what you get for the solution. Um, first set of initial conditions, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Second set, 0 0.1 plus 10 with the perturbation. And then I took the difference between these two guys, and it's nearly 0. Okay, it's in, in, indistinguishable um, to the naked eye, invisible to the naked eye. And then you bump rho, and I bumped it here all over, 20, up to 20. And this is what you get for x with the first set of initial conditions, second set of initial conditions. The difference is still the same. Now we go to the value of 24.2. We see some interesting things going on, on at the um, end of the time interval for the first and second set of initial conditions, but they're still the same. The difference is still 0. Now, what's so unique about this 24.2? Because when you go to 24.3, this is what happens. 
Okay, you start seeing a difference between the two solutions at the end. So if you simulate this, if you take um, the first set of initial conditions, second set, and this, this is in Python, so this is fresh, okay? And the difference between the two solutions, and I'm gonna vary rho, okay? I'm gonna start from rho equal one all the way to 30. Okay, see what happens? Difference is zero, difference is zero, difference is zero, boom, boom, boom. You start seeing crazy things happening at the end. And this is what they called chaos. It's essentially the extreme sensitivity to any slight change in initial or boundary conditions, okay? Now, rho is the equivalent to the Reynolds number, okay? Um, and, and then you think that turbulence occurs um, if you treat the Navier-Stokes equations as a set of dynamical equations, the Reynolds number uh, it makes them so sensitive to slight changes in initial and boundary conditions. And once those changes occur, you're going you're gonna to have different, a dif different behavior. But still, that doesn't explain why turbulence occurs, actually. There's, um, uh, I don't know who was it who sa he said, and when, I, when, I go, when I die and go to heaven, I'm going to ask God uh, two things. Um, uh, uh, about the unified theory of electromagnetism, uh, et cetera, and, you know, the unified theory in physics, and turbulence. And I have hope for the former. Okay, so, so uh, this tells you that uh, to, uh, from the perspective of turbulence people, this is the most important problem in the world, nothing else. Okay? Uh, m my perception of it is that you know, you introduce a perturbation, and, and for a given Reynolds number, so if, if the Reynolds number is less than the critical Reynolds number before you transition to turbulence, that perturbation dissipates, just like when we study instability. Um, but beyond a certain critical n Reynolds number, those perturbations, uh, 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 they, they're going to amplify. And, they, and if there's no mechanism in nature to suppress these, these to stabilize these um, perturbations, then the system is just going to unba grow unbounded. So turbulence is nature's way to respond to these um, 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 unbounded oscillations or unbounded perturbations in the initial and boundary conditions. Okay, so it, it, as we dig deeper into turbulence and the energy cascade, if, you've, if you know the energy cascade, that's what it's doing. It's taking these big perturbations and ripping them apart and dissipating them. But it gives you the impression of randomness. Okay, so let's talk about the energy cascade. Um, one of the first attacks in 1922 um, um, done by Richardson um, to, to look at the, uh, uh, so this is some theory of turbulence, okay? Again, this is not a course on turbulence, just kind of giving you a, an overview of some of the ideas that went into the development of a theory for turbulence. Um, so it was done by Richardson in 1922, um, one of the first attacks, and his hypothesis was the, uh, the energy cascade hypothesis, or the energy cascade uh, mechanism. And um, <clears throat> what he said is, uh, think of turbulence as a, a, uh, a hierarchy of structures, very large eddies that are of the size of the domain, all the way to very, 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 very small eddies to the, uh, down to the molecular level. Okay, so that's the qual qualitative description, and everything in between, okay? And then he said, okay, let's characterize each eddy, let's give each eddy um, um, uh, so he defined an eddy as a, as a turbulent motion localized within a region of size L, lowercase l. So that's the size of the eddy. These, these sizes range from the domain size, integral called the integral length scale, capital L, all the way to the smallest eddies, lower size L. And each eddy that has a length size L has a characteristic velocity UL and time scale tau L, L, which is L over U, so that's in seconds. And the largest eddies have length scales of this size comparable to the domain size. So pictorially, so this is just qualitative. There's nothing quantitative. We have to, we have to wait to call until Kolmogorov comes to the picture to quantify what the size of the eddy is, what lowercase l is. Rich, Richardson doesn't tell us what it is. It's, uh, he says oh, it just goes down to viscosity, OK? Um, so each eddy has a, so this is a description of what's happening in a flow. You have large eddies, and you have very small eddies, and everything in between. And each eddy has a Reynolds number. So for large eddies, because they're big, um, the Reynolds number is large, so therefore they're going to dissipate slower than the smaller eddies. 
And that's actually uh, observed in practice. Um, there was this example of this large vortical region in a, in a uh, I don't know where, where, where it was, where I heard it. But apparently, there was this large vortical structure in, a, in, in the ocean that took like a month to dissipate. Um, so it was v so, so large eddies actually take time to dissipate, OK, compared to small eddies. Uh, and the, pardon me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, compared to tornadoes. Yeah. 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 That's a good example. Thank you. And now the idea is that large eddies are unstable and break up, transferring energy to the smaller eddies. And then the smaller eddies undergo the same procedure and so on all the way down to viscosity. OK? And, and so, um, so this is, this, is the, uh, this is his perception of how turbulence behaves. You know, you have these large structures, and we're going to rip them apart. And they're gonna, we're going to keep ripping them apart all the way down to viscosity. And he wrote a little poem about it. And he said, big worlds have little worlds, which feed on their velocity. And little worlds have lesser worlds, and so on to viscosity. OK, so it was a very famous um, little poem. Anyway, so that's a qualitative description of the energy cascade, is that, is that the big eddies um, actually contain most of the energy in the flow. And then those big eddies eventually break up. And they give rise to smaller eddies, which continue to break to break down, and all the way to all of these uh, um, small and fine structures. Um, so it wasn't until Kolmogorov that we started having a more mathematical, rational description um, or a rational theory for turbulence. So he first introduced some. So again, this is just an overview. Okay, I, I, I'm not an expert on the details. Just kind of you read this, you can understand it and comprehend it. Um, and and what, what he first did, he introduced some useful scales. He denoted by L0 the length um, scale of an eddy comparable in size to the flow geometry. And then he denoted by this LEI, is 1 over 6 L0. I don't know how he got that number, um, to be the demarcation scale between the largest eddies and the smallest eddies. So L largest eddies, L greater than LEI, and L smaller than LEI. So that's kind of a, a, a point where we separate the large and small scales. Now he cr made. He proposed three hypotheses. Hypothesis one, called the hypothesis of local isotropy, and he said that at sufficiently high Reynolds number, the small scale motions are statistically isotropic. So what does isotropic mean? The, the same? OK. So there's so 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 there are I had an argument the other day with a with a chemist. Um, Trying to remember the the the, the details, um, uh, the, the difference between homogeneous, isotropic, and um, yeah, the difference between uh, homogeneous and and isotropic. Anyway, so yeah, you look, you have rotational symmetry as well, and so you look everywhere, things look the same. Okay, structures look the same. So uh, um, um, you could, for example, a piece of wood is homogeneous. Okay, but it's not isotropic. So homogeneous, it's wood everywhere. But you may shatter it easily along the grain. The grain is, is unidirectional, right? So you have these fibers running longitudinally. But so if you look at it longitudinally, it all looks like grains like this. But if you look at it perpendicularly, it has different properties, right? So you can break it differently in different directions, OK? So it's not isotropic um, in, in that sense. So properties are not the same um, or, or kind of structural properties. Anyway, so and, and the explanation here is that as the energy passes down the cascade from the large um, eddies to the smaller eddies, all information about directional properties of the large scales um, determined by flow geometry is lost. So we, the small eddies don't care where they came from. So, so you may be creating the large eddy by a lid. Okay, or by some weird, um, or by 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 a certain geometry, like a flow over a car, or you know, Mockbell's U-shaped thing. Okay, so you may creating those large structures from that geometry, but once those structures dissipate, the small structures don't care, right? I'm just a small structure. I don't care what I how I was created. So so that directional information and geometry information is lost. So that's why you kind of get this kind of local isotropy. Okay. Um, um, now the small enough eddies have a somehow universal character, and that's what if if we want to have a theory of turbulence, we want to have we we are looking for some universality 
And what Kolmogorov was trying to do is justify or find a, where the universal character of turbulence is. Because once we have a universal char character, we can say, oh, we're just going to model turbulent flow. Rather than saying, oh, we're going to model turbulence in a driven cavity versus turbulence over a car versus turbulence in a room. Okay? So once we find where that universal character is, we can just model that universal character because it's universal. Okay? Hypothesis two, which is called the first similarity hypothesis, he said that in every turbulent flow at also sufficiently Heron's number, the statistics of the small scale motions have a universal form that's uniquely determined by the viscosity and epsilon. Epsilon, we'll learn about that in a little bit, that's called the dissipation rate. The rate at which eddies lose their energy, just the dissipation rate. Nu is the viscosity and epsilon is the dissipation rate. So there's a range where um, uh, where the small scale motions have a universal form that's uniquely determined by nu and epsilon. Okay? Um, and I have a description here about this. Just as the directional properties are lost in the energy cascade, all information about the boundaries is also lost. And therefore, the important processes responsible for dissipation are determined by the viscosity and the dissipation rate. And finally, in every turbulent flow at sufficient Heron's number, there exists a range of scales whose properties are uniquely determined by epsilon, just the dissipation rate. Now, if for those of you who know the energy spectrum, this, these are the three regions. You have the production range, and then you have the dissipation range determined by epsilon, and then you have the viscous range. Okay? So um, if we are going from small to large, um, these are the scales that Kolmogorov determined. The, um, um, so this is LEI, the demarcation between the large scales and the small scales. Now these contain the energy, um, um, if you want. I mean, this is, not, this is not a very sharp kind of separation. But conceptually, think of it this way. Um, and these are the largest structures, size of the geometry, and the largest eddy. Uh, could be the same size of the geometry. And <clears throat> then you have this range that's uniquely governed by epsilon and the smallest scales governed by epsilon and the viscosity. Okay? And this gives rise to this classic energy spectrum. If you plot, if you take a turbulent flow and collect all the sizes of the eddies in your turbulent flow and put them in a histogram and plot them um, what plot on the uh, plot their energy, how much energy they have, so the kinetic energy they have, um, u squared, and plot it versus one over the size. So, so we flipped on um, the x-axis here. This is large, and we're going to small. So smallest scales are here, largest scales are here. What you have is the energy-containing eddies, the dissipation range governed by epsilon, and the viscous range governed by epsilon and nu. And that spectrum is near universal. So if you take a isotropic turbulent flow and plot the energy spectrum, it's going to look like this. You're going to find large eddies going to peak their energy. They contain all the energy. And then there's a range that is governed by just uniquely a dissipation rate. And then you have a range governed by nu and epsilon. OK, so we're done with the. Um, very basic theory of turbulence. Now we can go. Yes? Why is it like parabolic? It's not parabolic, but why is there like, like a bump? It goes. Yeah, yeah. Why, why does it bump? Like, I, I would expect it to go to that place that there was the energy to be the most energetic. To be, to be the, the most energetic. No. So this is typically. Um, so typically, they, you don't exactly have this. You're right. So typically, you start from here and go down. But this, um, this corresponds to what, what um, sometimes we call the forcing frequency. So you may have a, larging, a large eddy that's the, so take a box and shake it. You may have a large eddy that is the size of the box, but you may have other eddies that are of the same scale of your forcing frequency, okay, that contain more energy because you are forcing them to, vi to, to have higher energy, right? So that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Okay, so let's go into computing and mo uh, computing turbulence. Okay, all right. So, how do we attack this problem? All right. So there are three tiers um, that we know of to attack the problem of turbulence, and the first approach is direct numerical simulation. You've all heard of DNS, and what do we do in DNS? Yes, resolve everything. 
resolve all the time scales and resolve all the length scales. Okay? So if we know the size of the smallest scale, it could be you know, you know, a fraction of a millimeter or um, you know, a nanometer maybe, you, your grid needs to be smaller or equal to the smallest scale, your grid, smallest, your grid resolution. And your time scales are going to be on the order of 10 to the minus 6 seconds probably. Okay? Very small time. So to do a turbulent flow calculation, you're going to need a lot of grid points and a lot of time steps. Um, and I'll show you a, a, a back of the envelope calculation that shows you it may take us 5,000 years to do a reasonable um, DNS simulation. Okay? But DNS is the equivalent of an experiment. It's even better because it gives you pointwise data that you cannot obtain from an experiment. But it is the equivalent of an experiment. And many turbulence models have been developed based on DNS analysis of channel flows. It's amazing. Okay? Beautiful stuff. Next, up the ladder, so by decreasing order of cost and, complex, and increasing complexity. So DNS conceptually is the, is the simplest, right? If you just take the Navier-Stokes equations and use a very, very, very fine grid and very, very, very small time steps, you get DNS. You don't have to do anything else, OK? Now, next comes large eddy simulation where we say, hey, <coughs> let, us <coughs> let us resolve all the scales that are of this that can be captured by the grid let us solve those exactly and everything below those scales we're going to model so we know let's say take the lid driven cavity at high enough Reynolds number we know that the smallest scales let's say are going to be one millimeter let's say for the sake of the argument but yet you make your grid size your smallest grid size 10 centimeters okay sure so you're off by quite a bit so you capture in that case, what you do, you say, I'm going to capture all eddies from the size of the driven cavity all the way down to 10 centimeters. But I know there are scales that are smaller. So I have to model those. If you don't model those, your simulation is going to blow up. So keep that in mind as a kind of practical tip in your simulation. You may be running a simulation without a turbulence model. You keep increasing your Reynolds number, and then things blow up. What is going on? Then you start taking smaller time steps. You're OK, and then things blow up again. Why? Because you're not capturing those small scales. And what ends up happening, the, the equations, just like we talked about the truncation error, you are truncating the scales. And those scales have a way of adding energy to your system because you're not capturing them. You're not modeling their effects. They have to be there to dissipate the energy contained in the large flow. So that's how you think about it. So that's LES. And finally, and I think this is what most of you are interested in, in listening um, um, uh, about today, are RANDS models, or the Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes equations. And with RANDS, we are going to model everything. They say, you know what? I don't care what your grid resolution is. I'm, even if it's one grid point, let's model everything. Okay? So if you look at the energy spectrum <coughs> and um, try to superimpose DNS, LES, and RANS on top of the energy spectrum. DNS, what it's doing, it's computing all scales from the largest to the smallest. Okay? With LES, your grid resolution, also known as the Nyquist limit, that's the limit beyond which you cannot represent a signal. Okay? So, Given a signal and a set of um, a sampling frequency or a set of discrete data points, there's so much you can resolve out of a signal. So anything, if you have a finer signal, you're not going to resolve that. So that's what LES is. Any, any eddies that are smaller than the grid, you can't resolve those. And if we mark that point by this dashed line, we're going to compute all of these guys, and we're going to model everything below. But you want to make sure that. Um, now, if your LES model is consistent, you can keep moving this line over here, and you're going to recover DNS. Okay? As you refine your grid, you will recover DNS. And then with RANS, we model everything. Like, whatever. You know, I don't care about your grid resolution. Well, we care somewhat, but um, the idea is we're just going to model everything. Okay. 
So let's start with DNS. We're not going to talk about DNS much. Um, but as I said, the goal is to resolve and compute uh, all scales. But this makes DNS very expensive and only tractable for um, small Reynolds number because it turns out that the number of scales in a turbulent flow or the smallest scale can, is related to the Reynolds number. What that means is that you can write the number of grid points required to resolve the smallest scale as a function of the Reynolds number. Okay, do you know what that number is? You've probably seen it in your turbulent flow. So the number of grid points in one direction to resolve, uh, to fully resolve all scales is proportional to the Reynolds number to the power 3 over 4. So that's in 1D. In 3D, it's Reynolds number to the power 9 over 4. Okay, so I'll show you a, 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 a table next. And however, as I said, DNS is, is unbelievable, is like ex an experiment. Okay? So um, this is what happens um, if you are trying to do a DNS simulation uh, of a simple channel flow on a computer that does one gigaflops per second. Okay? So a, a gigaflop is 1024 megaflops. Okay? So one gigaflops per second. It's a lot of flops, floating point operations. So it's a very fast computer. For a Reynolds number of 94, this is showing you the number of points in 3D and the number of time steps required. And you can, you, I, I picked up this analysis from Stephen Post's book. But the point is, for a small Reynolds number, it will take you about 20 minutes to do this. For 375, it's nine hours. For 1,500, for Reynolds number 1,500, 13 days. So we're getting into um, the turbulent regime, right? 6,000, it takes you 20 months for a Reynolds number that is of interest to us. So, you, you know, you, you're driving your car, you're probably at a Reynolds number of 10 to the 5. So over here, a, about 100,000 is going to take you 5,000 years to do the DNS. So it is nearly impossible. Okay, so that's why we want computational power. Um, and we reserve DNS to very low Reynolds number flows. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to go to the other end of spectrum. So we said DNS, LES, and RANs. So I'm going to talk about RANs now. Okay. Which is they're, they're fun to talk about. Okay. So the idea of Reynolds averaging is um, is to say, okay, given a signal. So take the pipe flow again. Okay. And you put a, you measure the velocity at the center line. For a total Reynolds number, this is what you're going to get over time. Okay, you're going to get a single signal, crazy signal like this. The idea of Reynolds averaging is to say, hey, you know, this signal looks like a mean velocity, a mean value plus a fluctuation. Okay. So the mean value is given by this green line, and the fluctuation is given by this kind of red whole thing. Okay. So for a qu turbulent quantity phi, we're going to say that phi is equal to phi bar plus phi prime. Phi bar is the mean value okay, of that quantity. Now what we want for um, some properties of averaging, um, we're going to call also phi bar equal to this kind of um, um, bracket. I'm going to use those interchangeably. Okay. Um, now, what is the average of the fluctuation in this definition? Or what is the mean value of the fluctuation? So what is phi prime bar? Zero. Yeah. Why? It's by definition. <laughs> it's by definition, right? That's how we decompose it. It's by definition. Okay. The mean value of the fluctuation is zero. Okay. So, so that the bracket or the mean value of the fluctuation is zero. And that's very important. Okay? Because the mean, and, and another way to think about it, the mean kind of lives in the middle of this thing, right? And you're adding positive and negative values for the phi prime, and those are going to add up to zero. Now the mean is additive, so the mean value of two um, turbulent variables or two k random variables, a and b, is equal to the mean of a plus the mean of b. Okay? And this is important because now we're going to do the averaging procedure on the Navier-Stokes. Okay? Um, the mean of a constant times a random variable is equal to the constant times the mean. So the mean of C times phi is equal C times the mean of phi. 
the, uh, the mean and the, the spatial derivatives and time derivatives, they commute. So grad fee, mean of grad phi is grad of mean phi. Okay? And most importantly, the product, the mean of a product, and this is a very important property, and this distinguishes Reynolds averaging from filtering. We're going to see later. Okay? The mean of a product is actually equal to the product of the means plus the mean of the product of the fluctuations. Okay? So let's do the math together. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to decompose A into its mean value plus fluctuation and B into its mean value plus its fluctuation. Now notice what I'm doing for um, the way I'm writing the, the mean value. I use a capital letter to write the mean value. Okay? I didn't introduce that yet. Um, sorry about that. But um, uh, rather than using A bar, I'm just using capital A. That's the mean value of A plus a fluctuation. Mean value of B is capital B plus fluctuation. So then you do the products over here. You get A times B plus AB prime plus A prime B plus A prime B prime. Okay? And because the mean, the brackets are additive, that gives us this summation. Mean of, mean of the product of the means, what is that going to be? There's going to be AB because those mean values are actually like constants over that average, over that mean, right? So they just come out. It doesn't affect them because the mean of a constant is a constant, okay? So the mean of the mean is, is the mean, or the mean of the mean of the mean of the mean is always the mean, okay? So the mean of A, capital A, capital B is capital A, capital B. Now, what is the mean of AB prime? Zero, why? A, yep, A is, 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 comes out, and then you have the mean of B prime, which is zero. Same thing for A prime B, and then you're left with these two guys, okay? The mean of A prime B prime, okay? Now, we haven't defined what we mean by the, av by the mean, what we mean by the mean, or what we mean by the average. You could say, I'm going to take uh, the, int the mean value over time, okay? Just like we said when you're measuring the velocity. But what that implies is that you cannot do unsteady Navier-Stokes. If you take the Navier-Stokes and you take the mean over time, the average over time, you're going to kill the time-dependent term. So we need a, another way to define, uh, we need other ways to define a mean. And one of the most general ways is to do an ensemble average. And to say, rather than taking a mean value over time, I'm going to repeat the experiment a thousand times and take the average value over all experiments. Okay, at a given point. So that defines an ensemble average given um, over experiments. But they, all of these retain the same properties okay, that we discussed. But this allows you to do unsteady, uh, um, unsteady RANs, Reynolds average, average Navier Stokes equations. Okay? This is for mathematical rigor, but once we do the means, we're never, we actually rarely, we don't use this because we are going to be solving for the mean value. Okay? So now, so what, what's the idea here? What, what is the Reynolds average trying to do? We're going to take this infinite number of scales and reduce it to a mean value, which is that one scale, okay, the mean value, plus some combination of the fluctuations which we're going to model. So we've taken the problem of infinite degrees, large number of degrees of freedom, and reduced it significantly into in resolving a mean value, which still has structure and interesting things, but it's, it's not as complex as the turbulent flow. Okay? So when we apply the averaging procedure to the Navier-Stokes equations, we recover the so-called Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. So when you hear RAND's modeling, this is essentially saying our turbulence model is based on the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations. That's it. Okay? Now, we'll understand in a second what we mean by a model, a RANS model. Okay? Now, we're going to decompose the velocity and pressure into a mean value, capital U, plus a fluctuating value, lowercase u prime. Same thing for the pressure, capital P plus P prime. You can apply this to the um, 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 to scalars as well, okay? or other forms of the equations. But these are the simplest incompressible equations. This is kind of where the development was. Okay? So now let's start with averaging the continuity equation. Okay? So we're going to take the continuity equation and apply the average. So the average of div u is div of the average. And that tells us that div of the mean value is 0. So the continuity equation 
also holds for the mean value. Great. Okay. So we haven't changed anything, just changed symbols from lowercase u to capital U. Okay. But this also implies that the uh, primed velocity, the fluctuation, is also solenoidal. Okay. You can easily show this by saying div u is equal to div capital U plus u prime. And because div capital U is 0, then div u prime is u. Okay. Now we average the momentum equations. And we're going to apply an average to, e to the entire equation. And that gives us the average of each term. Okay. So we get d average u by dt plus div average u u um, minus you know, 1 over rho um, grad average p plus nu del squared u. So you notice all of these terms are readily transformable into just mean values, right? Except for the convective term, OK? Except for the convective term. So what that does, that gives us the first step towards the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations, OK? So this is the average u by dt plus div average of u u. So we don't know what to do with this yet, minus grad average p plus nu del squared u. So now we still need to figure out what to do with the convective term. So let's apply the same procedure we did um, earlier for the product. So I'm going to decompose u into capital U plus u prime. Okay. So what happens here, you get u u plus 2 u u prime plus u prime u prime. And then you split the average. You get div average u u, which is div u u average. Okay. Now this guy is going to be 0, right? And this guy is going to remain the same. So this guy is 0. And that gives us, for the convective term, div of the uh, product of averages plus div of the average of the product of the fluctuations. Okay, And that gives us, actually, the um, Reynolds average Navier-Stokes or Reynolds average momentum equations, which look like this, plus the addition or minus this term, the divergence of the um, mean of the fluctuations. Now, this is a tensor. U prime U prime is a tensor that looks like this. And actually, we call this, this thing is called the Reynolds stress tensor because it looks like a stress tensor. Okay? It looks like a stress tensor. So we call this the Reynolds stress tensor. Okay? Now, formally, the Rand's equations are given by this system of equations div u equals 0, and then du dt plus div u u, same as the Navier-Stokes, plus this extra term over here. We don't know what to do with this term yet, OK? Now, <clears throat> they look the, sa the same as the Navier-Stokes, right? Except with the addition of a source term on the momentum equations. That's what's so great about this modeling procedure, OK? We know how to work with these equations. All the numerical methods that we learned still apply to these equations. But what is the problem here? Do you see a problem? So I say I'm, I gave you this system of equations. I want you to solve for u and p. So what's the problem here? So how many unknowns and how many equations do you have? What? So we have, no, we have four equations, right? Because these are three, right? Three equations. So we have four equations, continuity and three momentum. But how many unknowns do we have? u, v, w, p, u prime, v prime, w prime, seven unknowns. Okay, So we have four equations and seven unknowns. And that, my students, is known as the turbulence closure problem. Okay, Similar to what you guys did in LES. Same thing. Okay, But the meaning of filtering and averaging is different. We'll see later. Now, we need a way to figure out what to do with this term. What are we going to do with this term? We don't know if we knew what the fluctuations were. We didn't. We don't need averaging, in the first place. Okay, we don't need to do modeling. We just yeah. We just solve for. We know the fluctuations. We don't need to do any modeling. Okay. And in fact, we haven't done anything that is not rigorous over here. I mean, these are still the same equivalent to the original equations. We just kind of manipulated them in an in interesting way. And we're solving for the mean velocity. These are the equations of these are the exact equations of the mean velocity, in other words. And if you knew u prime, you can reconstruct you can reconstruct the total velocity by saying total velocity is equal to mean velocity plus u prime. Okay. So the solution um, for the closure problem is to do one of the following. 
either model the Reynolds stress tensor and say, you know, we're going to use physical ideas and physical principles to, to find a form of the, to model the Reynolds stress tensor in terms of the mean velocity. Remember, we're solving for the mean velocity. Okay? So we know what the mean velocity is. So if we can write the Reynolds stress tensor in terms of the mean velocity, then we close the system. Okay? The other solution is, just like we developed a equation, equations for the mean velocity, let's develop equations for the stress tensor. So can we develop an equation for d by dt of mean u prime u prime? Yeah, we can. But that's going to create another problem, because you're going to start creating triple correlations, u pri u i prime, u j prime, u k prime. And then you can develop an equation for those. And then you're going to end up with quadruple correlations. Now, in statistical theory, these are known moment, as, as moments. Um, the u prime u prime is a second order moment. The u prime u prime u prime is its third order moment and fourth order moment and so on. Okay, so these are known as um, moments. Okay, so so we ended up with a second order moment that we need to close, that we need to to model. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> turns out there is a. This is what we're going to learn about today. Okay. Um, and we're going to talk about first order closure and second order closure. So what we're going to do with the first order closure, we're going to take the, the Reynolds stress tensor and model it directly. With the second order closure, we're going to develop equations for the stress, ta stress tensor and model the triple correlations. Okay? So you see the, the nomenclature. We're modeling the second order moment, but that's a first order closure directly on the second order moment. And then we transport the second order moment and we model the third order moments. That's the second order closure. Okay. First order models, okay, they are based on the analogy between turbulent and laminar flow. So one could say, you know, this looks like a stress tensor. So why don't we model it like the Newtonian stress tensor? So if the laminar stress tensor is given by this guy, mu dui by dxj plus duj by dxi, why not call the um, Reynolds stress tensor, we call it here tau ij turb, make it equal to some viscosity, okay, some viscosity times the um, um, rate of strain. Okay, so, so th by the way, this is called the rate of strain tensor, okay? But notice here, we're, we made the Reynolds stress tensor a function of the mean velocities. So what's the only unknown here? Mu turbulent, yeah, the turbulent viscosity. Because we know these guys, agreed? We're solving for those. They're part of the governing equations. We don't know mu t. So the goal is then to find the turbulent viscosity. And that's what the, um, what the essence of first order models is about. Is if we assume this form for the Reynolds stress, we put that in the governing equation, okay? Then all we have to do is find a single number. Mu t. That can vary or in space and in time. We don't care. It's just an additional number that you add to the governing equation. This is great, right? Simplifies things conceptually quite a bit. So then, the beauty of this approach is that you can incorporate it neatly into the governing equations, and you just augment your molecular viscosity by a turbulent viscosity. Now, this is the case for the incompressible constant density flow, but think of this term as diff tau. Okay? So in the, in, the, in the original equations, we had a diff tau and a divergence of a, a, a Reynolds stress tensor. But if we write the Reynolds stress tensor as mu t times tau, then we can combine those two, right? And then, say, we're just augmenting our molecular viscosity by a turbulent viscosity. Okay? So that's why you've heard me blab in the past, unless you're doing like Rand's models, you're going to be quite dissipative. That's why. Because we are adding viscosity to the system. And in essence, we are trying to model the effects of the small scales, which all the theories, from the energy cascade to the Kolmogorov theories, tell us that you know these guys are dissipative. Small scales are dissipative. Okay. Okay, 
with <clears throat> first order models, we also have a hierarchy. We have zero equation models, one equation models, two equation models, okay? So we're going to start with the zero equation models that do not require you to solve any additional equations. You just make an assumption on, on what the turbulent viscosity is. And you use mixing length theory from um, um, Prantl, which uh, uses dimensional analysis and says, OK, if nu t, if the viscosity has units meter squared per second, um, that's actually can be assumed as the product of a sum length scale times a velocity scale, right? So meter times meter per second. And if you follow that approach, you can assume, posit a form for the turbulent viscosity and say this is equal to L0, that's a mixing some, some length scale, which is meter, times, uh, times L0 du by dy, meter times meter per second per meter. Okay? So that gives you the units meter squared per second. Okay? So, so then that goes away with the velocity scale. We're assuming the velocity scale is equal to du by dy, the local shear. Okay? Then how do we get L0? Well, we either find it from experiment or throw in some numbers in practice, okay? Um, but this model is, is not the best model, okay? It, it, it does very well for problems where you know the mixing length scale, the mixing, the mixing length. But the mixing length is not universal, okay? As I illustrate here in the pros and cons, um, advantages is easy to implement. It's really fast and good predictions for simple flows where the mixing length can be determined experimentally or theoretically. The disadvantages is it's incapable of predicting flows where the mixing length changes, like flows with separation, okay, um, uh, or with with oscillations and recirculation. Okay. So the next, uh, if we want to add complexity, we're going to go to um, to one equation models and say, okay, let's improve. Let's keep the 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 length scale L, but let's improve our velocity scale. So how can we get a better velocity scale? The argument is, well, you know, turbulence, since we've characterized turbulence by energy, 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 so why can't we use energy to get a velocity scale? And the idea is, let's take the turbulent kinetic energy, which is 1 over 2 u squared, right, and say that our velocity scale is the square root of the turbulent kinetic energy. That seems like a reasonable scale, right? That tells us gives us an idea of where we are at on the energy spectrum. Okay? And the turbulent kinetic energy is defined by this guy. So now we've added one and we added one unknown. We don't know what this is, right? Because we don't know what the mean of the fluctuations are. Okay, that's that's the problem we set out to solve in the first place, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and develop an equation for the turbulent kinetic energy. Um, it's really annoying, and uh, I, I think I have a typo somewhere here. But anyway, it's this really nasty um, um, equation that introduces a ton of more unknowns. So now you have a, um, a pressure correlation, a third order correlation, and then you have you still have this guy over here, and then you have um, this guy over here. So um, <laughs> we've added a lot more unknowns. But what do we do? We first um, simplify this form and write it in this form. So PK is actually um, the combination of these guys, the combination of these guys, and we're going to model that. We're going to say, hey, we're going to model it. Okay? That's what modeling is about. Now, the arguments for the models, you can go through the papers and try to understand what they're trying to do. But the ideas are simple, is that you model PK, the, that's called the pressure diffusion correlation, as this thing. Again, you see the turbulent viscosity show up, and you have the um, average mean values for the velocity. And then we model the dissipation rate, epsilon, as a constant times kinetic energy to the 3 over 2 over L. So we put this back in here and put this guy over here. We solve for the kinetic energy. We take the kinetic energy and get a velocity scale, and then multiply that by a mixing length to get the eddy viscosity, or the turbulent viscosity. OK, but this is still annoying, because we still have the, velo the, the length scale. OK, the mixing length is always the caveat. So now we have to develop an equation for the mixing length, or actually think of an alternative scaling for the viscosity. 
And this is where two equation models come in. Um, to overcome the limitations of the non-universality universality of the mixing length, um, we look at two equation models, which redefine the scaling of the viscosity and write that in terms of the two important parameters of the energy cascade. So what are the three things that matter in the energy cascade? There's the energy, dissipation rate, and viscosity. Okay, so let's relate those three together. Um, and if you do just scaling based on units, this is the form of the viscosity. It's some constant times k squared over epsilon, where k is the turbulent kinetic energy, epsilon is the dissipation rate. Okay? So as I mentioned earlier, the universality of the kinetic energy um, um, and the importance of it in turbulence. OK, so I, I still have time. I'm looking at my clock over here, and it's, it's confusing me. OK, so, um, <coughs> so, the, the, so in, the, in the one equation model, we introduce the kinetic energy, um, and we use a length scale. But the kinetic energy alone, one, one other issue with the kinetic energy is it doesn't distinguish between large and small eddies. Because a large eddy that's moving slowly can have the same kinetic energy as a small eddy that's moving really fast. So the way we distinguish between these two eddies is through the dissipation rate, because we know that smaller eddies dissipate faster than larger eddies. And this is where we introduce the, the dissipation rate, and it's defined as this tensor. Epsilon equals nu um, dui by dxj duj by dxi prime. Okay? So that's the definition of epsilon. And this leads us to the first two equation model, the most popular, called the k epsilon model. Okay? With the k epsilon model, um, to spare us all the complexity, we have two model equations. We add two model equations to our governing equations, one for the kinetic energy and one for the dissipation rate. These are just scalar transport equations. Okay? You're, you don't care about computing k as 1 over 2 u prime u prime. You just solve for k. But this is the governing equation for k. This is the governing equation for epsilon. What do we have here? We have simplified and modeled forms, or the simplified the model forms of the true equations for k and epsilon. Okay? And you have a bunch of constants, c2 over here, c3, c4, and c5. Everything is in terms of known quantities. Okay? Nu t is still equal to k squared over epsilon. Okay? Everywhere. In the Navier-Stokes, in the k equation, in the epsilon equation. So we added two more equations with two more unknowns, k and epsilon, to help us define nu t. Okay? So nu t is k squared over epsilon. So you can plug that in here. And then you're solving for k. Time advance. Simple. You know, we know how to solve this. The problem is always in the constants. Those can be determined experimentally or from DNS simulations. The, a common set of constants that's used is for C mu, that's for the um, um, uh, constant for the uh, turbulent viscosity, it's 0.09. C2 is 1. Actually, C2 is related to the Prandtl number. Okay, so we assume the Prandtl number is equal to 1. And C3 is 0.769, C4, 1, 4, 4. I mean, this can be obtained from experiment. Look at the papers. But that's the idea. Okay? So now, now you're, getting the, you're getting the gist of how turbulence modeling works. Okay? We, want, we started by introducing an averaging procedure. Um, we wrote the true velocities or a true turbulent quantity as a mean value average over time or over an ensemble of experiments plus a deviation. Okay, we plug those back into the governing equations. That gave us an equation for the mean, equations for the mean value of the velocity, plus an unknown tensor. We call that the Reynolds stress tensor. Then we said we're gonna with the first order modeling approach, we're gonna model the stress tensor as being equal, as being as looking the same as a Newtonian laminar stress tensor, mu t turbulent viscosity times a rate of strain, known rate of strain in terms of the mean values. And the purpose, the goal now, is to find mu t. So how do we find mu t? We use mixing length, or we use the um, k epsilon scaling. Then we have to develop equations for k and epsilon. We develop those equations. They're going to introduce new correlations. We're mo we will model those correlations using the same ideas that we use to model everything. And you know what? They work. They work pretty well. There's a ton of turbulence models. There's as many turbulence models as there are groups. And if you read a paper, from a group who developed a model, they 
developed, and they tell you that their model is the best because it works best for their system. But of course, because nothing beats developing, fine tuning a model for your own system, right? So that's what makes it so great, right? If you apply it to other systems, eh, it starts losing properties. But performance. But K epsilon, the K epsilon model has done really well. It is really easy to implement, stable calculations, good predictions overall. Um, again, some poor predictions for swirling and rotating flows, flows with separations. Um, non-circular ducts, and it has near wall issues because the kinetic energy actually goes to zero near the wall, but if you're not resolving the wall, you're gonna miss that, so you have to do some wall modeling, but those are kind of finer issues that you don't have to worry about. Um, the governing equations can be stiff because you have these k squared over epsilon, and, and competition between kinetic energy and dissipation rate can make the equations stiff, okay? Um, and over the years, you will, you will, if you go on the Fluent website, you can see the real, they have the realizable K epsilon model and the RNG, renormalization group theory, turbo K epsilon model. So all of these are ways to either fine tune the constants, redefine some of the correlations. Um, they all fit within the same framework. The K omega model, rather than uh, doing things in terms of the strain rate, they do it in terms of the um, vorticity, um, omega, you know, and so, Anyway, it's, it's the same idea, okay? That's the idea of this first order closure, okay? You start by assuming this Reynolds stress tensor looks like the um, Newtonian stress tensor, and our goal is to find the turbulent viscosity, okay? Now, scalar transport, Elizabeth was interested in, in reacting flows um, um, the other day. Um, assuming you're solving all species, you know, you're gonna have to do some averaging or filtering procedure. And what applies for the momentum equations also applies for the scalar equations. So the same way we model the stress tensor, um, the Reynolds stress tensor as an equivalent to the um, um, shear strain or the laminar stress tensor, what we get for when we do the averaging procedure for like say a passive scalar like temperature over here, advection diffusion, you're gonna get a correlation that looks like mean of u prime t prime. And then what we're gonna do, we're, it's, we're gonna use what's called the gradient diffusion hypothesis. We're gonna assume that this guy is simply just um, a modified turbulent diffusion coefficient times grad um, of the uh, average temperature. Now, how do you get this? We don't always model it the same way we did the turbulent viscosity. We actually use the Schmidt number to relate it to the turbulent viscosity. So if you can compute the turbulent viscosity from your model, then this guy is mu over the Schmidt number, and then you set your Schmidt number. You say Schmidt number is one or 0.7, okay? And kind of that's the general idea. And same thing applies for LES, okay? Okay, second order models. Um, the central concept, and as I alluded to before, is rather than modeling the stress tensor directly, we're gonna develop transport equations for that stress tensor. So I'm gonna spare you the complexity. It's really annoying to drive these equations, and they're rarely used anyway, except beyond academic circles. I don't think there's much use for the Reynolds stress model. It's really complicated. Um, but the most important problem here is that we result in triple and quadruple and quint quintuple correlations that need more equations or need modeling. So you haven't, you're conserving the modeling. But the, the further away you model, um, the better you're gonna compute things, okay? So the Reynolds stress model or the Reynolds, the second order models, they do, be, they do perform much better than first order mo models. Um, and there are two classic models that are called the algebraic stress model and the two classic second order models, the algebraic stress model and the Reynolds stress model. I'll show you very briefly what the first one looks like. This is a transport equation for the Reynolds stresses, and these terms are really nasty. They're like two pages long. So I better call them PIJ and VIJ, but they contain terms that have triple correlation, okay? And they need modeling, all right? So the Reynolds stress model are, is very expensive, and, but it allows you to capture anisotropic effects, okay? So it does better than, um, uh, than just the uh, uh, eddy viscosity or the uh, assuming that the stress tensor looks like a laminar stress tensor, okay? So remember here, we're not using mu t 
equal, uh, we're not using stre random stress tensor equal mu turbulent times something that looks like a laminar tensor. No, we're just mod we're just computing um, um, u prime u prime. Okay. Okay. So in practice, don't use the RSM. If you're using commercial package, go with the K epsilon model. Realizable K epsilon model is one of the best out there, or the K omega. Okay. Those are some of the best models out there. All right. Um, we have 10 minutes, so I think I can touch on large eddy simulation. Um, so uh, you guys have, yeah, did you take LES? Yeah, and you took LES. You two haven't taken LES yet. OK. So um, large eddy simulation is one of my favorite simulation strategies. Um, <clears throat> in LES, we compute everything that the grid can capture. And that's a reasonable, that, that's actually a given. If you have a, a fine enough uh, uh, grid, well, you're going to you're going to compute everything that the grid can compute. Okay, so why why model everything like we do in RANS? Let's take whatever we can compute, and and everything that we cannot compute, we're going to model. Okay, so anything below the grid resolution is modeled. Um, we call that the subgrid. So there's nothing fancy about the word subgrid. It's essentially Pardon me. Um, um, think of them as eddies that are smaller than the grid size, or that the grid cannot capture. Okay, they're called subgrid. That's why we say subgrid models. Okay. Um, but for things to be meaningful, of course, um, the grid resolution needs to be large enough. Certainly larger than that required for um, RANS models. Otherwise, you know, you need to be within the dissipation range or a little bit closer. You need to have fine enough resolution for LAS to be meaningful. Okay. OK, so <clears throat> how do we then separate what the grid can compute and what the grid cannot compute? That's the main challenge in LES. How do we separate that? Okay, we can say that we're going to write a, total qu a full quantity phi as phi tilt plus phi prime, where Microsoft wants to update. Sorry. OK. Where Phi tilde is the computed value, and phi prime is the value that we cannot compute on the grid. Okay, so we can write this, and this is called a filtering operation. Um, but it has nothing to do with averaging. The filtering operation has a precise mathematical meaning that forces a quantity to be, that separates a quantity from um, given a certain size, like a grid size. It separates whatever can be captured by that grid size from everything that cannot be captured by, um, below, uh, by, by that grid size. OK, so LES is similar to a sieve. Okay? If you think of your grid as a sieve, okay, whatever you can capture in the sieve, those are the resolve scales. Those are your phi tilt. Okay? And whatever goes through are the phi primes. They are the uncomputed quantities. Okay? It's a nice way of thinking about large eddy simulation and filtering. Okay, um, so whatever is caught, that's phi tilt, and whatever falls, that's phi prime. The larger the opening, or the coarser the grid, the more stuff will fall, and the less will be filtered, and vice versa. The sieve represents the grid. Okay, and whatever falls is the subgrid. Okay. Now, <coughs> the properties of filtering. I'm not going to go. I did not specifically put the mathematical definition of filtering because I think that misleads people sometimes. I'd rather you have an intuitive understanding of filtering, okay? Um, because we, in practice, we never use filtering. The grid automatically filters things out. By definition, whatever you can resolve on the grid is the filtered quantity, right? So what we need now is figure out what, what we're going to do with whatever falls through the cracks, okay? So the properties of the filter, if you look at the mathematical definition, is that um, it shouldn't change constants. It should be linear. So the filter of the addition is the addition of filtered quantities. And it should commute. It should be independent of time and, and space. So it should commute with derivatives. Okay? Now, most importantly, and that's the most important property of filtering, is that the filter of the primed quantities is not 0. Okay? And that's, kind of the, that's the, the, the key difference between filtering and averaging. The filter of the primed quantities or the filtered primed quantities is not zero. OK? 
okay, because they already were filtered, right? So there's, they, they just went through. You cannot, you, you cannot capture them anymore. So, so the filter of the prime quantity is not zero. Contrast that to the averaging, where the average of um, the prime quantities is zero for real average. So that's a key distinction between the two. Okay, and that's going to impact what is what you're going to see um, um, uh, uh, in your in your final equation. So, um, um, <coughs> if you're into photography, okay, I do uh, do the following. Next time, go to a smokestack. Okay, so go go see where there's a smokestack and there's smoke coming out, kind of like steam or something. Maybe this thing here, and then there's all of these structures coming out. If you you're looking at that, that's DNS. Okay, that's DNS. What is RANS? <coughs> RANS is you take a series of photos and you average them. So you get this nice kind of cotton candy looking structure. Okay, so this is your camera. So then what is LES? So with DNS, it's like you take a very fast snapshot, like one over 10,000 seconds shutter speed. You capture the instantaneous structures. You see all the fine structures. No. With, with RANS, you take a series of shots and you average them. Okay. Or long, that's RANS. That's RANS. Yeah. But what is LES? It's an out of focus picture of the smokestack. So you slightly defocus it. You filtered some of it a little bit. Okay. So in other words, what you see, this is what you see with RANS. This is what you see with LES. But with DNS, you're going to see even more structures in here. Okay. Um, I still have three minutes, and I think I can take you through the filtering procedure to show you that we have the same problem that we had with RANS. Okay. So if you take now the filter of the Navier-Stokes. Um, this is what we get. Everything, all of these quantities remain filtered, and we still have to deal with the convective term. So it's interesting that it's the convective term that represents turbulence rather than the diffusion term, although the Reynolds number multiplies. It's 1 over the Reynolds number that multiplies the diffusion term. It's, it, it, yeah. Nature is interesting. Okay. So now we're going to do a trick, because we know if we separate this guy, we're not going to be able to zero out the filter of the primes. Okay, Just like we, if you remember what we did with the Reynolds average, when we took <coughs> the average of the product, we said that's equal to u, uh, to u squared plus 2u u prime plus u prime squared. And the, two, the average of the 2u u prime was 0. We can't do that here. Okay, So what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to just do a trick. We're going to say that. U U tilde is equal U tilde U tilde plus U U tilde minus U tilde U tilde. Okay? So we did nothing here except add and subtract U tilde U tilde. Okay? Now, why did we do this? What is this quantity here? What does this quantity represent? So if you think of U U as one, if you think of U U as a quantity, we are taking the difference between the filter of U U, okay? And the product of the filtered UU. So that gives you everything that the grid cannot resolve. That difference gives you the net stuff that your grid cannot resolve. That's the net stuff that comes through the grid. Okay? UU tilde minus U tilde U tilde, that difference gives you the net of what the grid cannot resolve. And we're going to call that, oops. We're going to call that that the subgrid stress tensor. Okay, so in this case, our stress tensor is we call it stress tensor because it looks like a tensor. Okay, our is subgrid values is quantities that we could not capture on the grid, but they are going to show up. Trust me, if you do an LES simu if you do a simulation um, of a turbulent flow and you don't resolve all the scales. These guys are going to kill you. They're going to blow up your solution, just like with the truncation error. Truncation error is going to show up, rear its head, and do dispersion and instability. Same thing here. You're truncating the scales. You better model them. If you don't model them, they're going to come up and blow up your solution. Okay. So we need to model this. So if we go back to the governing equation, now we have 
something that looks like the Navier-Stokes, except we're solving for filtered quantities, or just the quantities that can be resolved by the grid, duh. But we need to add a source term, or subtract, add a source term, actually, um, so that we can account for what we didn't capture on the grid. Okay? So now we start with the LES modeling. And the simplest models are eddy viscosity models. And again, we bring the analogy between, lamin uh, between turbulent and laminar flows and say, hey, it's a stress tensor. Let's model it similar to the Newtonian stress tensor and say that the subgrid stress tensor looks like a turbulent viscosity times a shear rate, uh, sh rate, rate of strain tensor as a function of the filtered quantities. And now, all we need to do is find new t. Okay? Brilliant. So beautiful. Conceptually, this is much easier than, than Rand's modeling because we've resolved so much of the flow. I'm more comfortable now using an, a mixing length model for new t right here because we've computed so much, right? Anyway, we've done, so, we've done such a high resolution, we've computed so much, then we can just simply assume a mixing length um, 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 approach, and this is what the Smagorinsky model does. Smagorinsky model's simplest LES model works beautifully for the most part. It says, hey, nu t is equal to some constant times a length scale, which is equal to your average grid size. Now you know your length scale because you're resolving what we've done with LES. We know what our smallest length scale is, the, dom the, the length scale of, the, of this problem, and that's delta squared, and some scaling with for the velocity. So if you think of S, S, that's like a, and then the square root, the units will just work out to be for um, a turbulent viscosity. Anyway, that's the Smagorinsky model. And very briefly, I'll show you a simulation that I did in, in my code for the flow over an open, driven, uh, open cavity. This is showing the turbulent viscosity and how it changes in space. And you see where the turbulent, there's no turbulent viscosity in regions where the flow is nice and laminar. Okay, and uniform, but where, where you have a lot of um, stuff going on, your turbulent viscosity is non-zero, okay? And showing, this is, and the bottom is showing the kinetic energy, okay? Anyway, many more models, dynamic models, a um, bunch of other things. Okay, you, get, you guys can go. I'll continue next week.